Um, uh, today's lecture is uh, the introduction to beam theory, beam bending. We're going to cover beam bending today, or at least a portion of it. This is an exceptionally important topic in uh, structural mechanics for aerospace engineers. Um, it underlies so many of our useful analysis techniques for structures that are included in things like airframes, you know, airplanes and uh, rockets and um, other flight vehicles, of course, also um, ground-based vehicles and uh, even things like bridges and, and other similar entities uh, are all typically analyzed by some variation of the techniques that we're going to begin to learn today. Uh, today's lecture would normally, if we were in person, involve a demo. And unfortunately, uh, we can't do that demo uh, because we're not all physically present together. Um, but nevertheless, I found a video that uh, pretty closely repl replicates the demo that I would have done for you. So I would like you to just watch a few seconds of this video. Um, there's no sound. I've turned the sound off and uh, we'll kind of talk through what we see here. Now, what this individual is showing us is meant to help us begin to visualize this concept called, called beam bending. Okay, I'm going to pause it here and we'll end up talking about this image uh, sort of substantially uh, throughout the, the day today. And uh, what you need to know about beam bending is this is what we would call an engineering solution. So as you recall from, oh, say, the last couple of lectures, we know how now to solve elasticity problems. What are these elasticity problems? Well, they're field equations. So the field variables vary at every point within the structural body. Uh, they vary according to these differential equations, which are, you know, ordinary differential equations, but they're coupled and uh, they are uh, uh, of higher order, really, when it comes right down to it, because we have strain and stress, both of which involve derivatives. And so these, these problems uh, can be very, very difficult to solve. In fact, they can be so difficult that they're impossible. For, for many, if not most, uh, engineering structures, there is no closed-form solution to what the stress, strain, deflection, um, and other properties of the field would be. Uh, when I say no closed form solution, that means we can't write a simple equation that describes the strain and the stress in the structural body. Now that's counter, I think, to what you may have assumed having sat through many structural mechanics style lectures, you know, your mechanics of materials lectures, your uh, your statics lectures, maybe even some of your dynamics lectures. And in all of those problems, we, when we calculated something like strain and stress, we could calculate it because the geometries were largely so simple that it was possible making a few assumptions to calculate stress and strain. But as you saw last lecture, for many problems, uh, even simplistic ones, the solution of those equations can be quite difficult. And for any non-trivial geometry, in fact, we can't there just is not a solution that exists in closed form with known functions, known equations that we can write that would adequately describe strain and stress within the structural body. So knowing this, structural mechanics is hard. So what do we, what do we strive to achieve as structural analysts? Well, we try and make these difficult problems tractable. We try and make them something that we can solve, uh, either in closed form, having made several approximations, or alternatively, we sort of reconfigure the question, we reconfigure the geometry, we do what would be called the discretization, and then we solve a, a, a large number of simpler problems. And we'll get to that a little bit later in the semester. Very briefly, we'll spend just a little bit of time in lecture on it, and then you're going to do the finite element problem uh, project in order to experience that. And so when I say we discretize the problem, we break it up into perhaps millions of smaller, simpler problems, and then let the computer do the math. Okay, we're not quite there yet. We don't have completely the foundation in order to uh, 
uh, describe that or complete that analysis. We're going to begin understanding some of that uh, now with the next lectures. And then, um, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to develop the theories that will aid us in ultimately um, creating these finite element problems that will allow us to solve the complex geometries that real engineering structures are made from. Okay, so that's <clears throat> that's my argument in favor of, of formulating engineering solutions rather than theoretical elasticity solutions. So we want a simpler solution. I gave you the hint that we can make assumptions that do greatly simplify the problem. So if you look at this image uh, that uh, this individual is showing us, this sort of loosely approximates what we would call beam deflection. Okay, if I go back a little bit in the video where he's holding it horizontally, you can see this sort of approximates what we would call a beam. Now, we'll very specifically define our assumptions of what a beam is in a few minutes, but uh, briefly, as we look at this, what we're seeing is we're seeing a structure that generally is longer in one direction than it is in the other two directions. So as we watch this video, he's going to spin this foam block for us to show us that it's thin in what is now the vertical direction and also thin in the direction that's sort of into the plane relative to this video. So um, you'll, you'll see that here in a moment. <clears throat> Okay, he's bending it, and I want you to be observing the deflection that occurs. Did you see the cross section there? It was it was loosely square, you know, approximately square. It was at least rectangular, if not square. And uh, now what he's showing us is uh, some lines that he's drawn on here. Now I want you to carefully watch the lines as he's bending this structure. So he's identified the horizontal line, which we will eventually call the reference line. He's event, he, he showed us vertical lines. And what's important as he's showing this vertical line, uh, well, let me pause and ask you, do you notice anything? I'm going to take a moment for reflection here for, for you guys as students. Um, what do you see as this uh, structural body deforms? The vertical lines stay perpendicular to the horizontal line. Yeah, that's a great observation. Um, uh, I don't uh, know who said that, but thank you for offering that. Uh, I'm seeing some comments also in the chat window. Dylan says, above the reference is in compression and below the reference is in tension. That is absolutely also a true statement. And Scott also echoed that same statement. So we've already begun to observe something about the deformation that occurs in this beam uh, based on essentially just drawing some reference lines on the beam. I'm going to allow, allow the video to play just a little bit more. Is there anything else that you notice? Seems like it's not entirely um, uniform and it's bending. It bends more in the middle, but like the outside three or so blocks seem to be straight whenever he bends it. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's a good observation. Let me go back to sort of find this, uh, this observation that was just being described. Um, what was said, if you didn't pick it up, is that as he's deforming this beam, it sort of has the appearance that these last outer three, maybe three or so on each side, aren't really deforming and inside they are deforming and there may be some sort of overall sort of average decrease in the sort of axial length of this beam. Now I, I would agree with, with that statement with regard to how he's bending this. Um, when I do a, a demo that would be quite similar to this, I actually use a, a longer beam that's a little bit uh, smaller and I'm very careful to make sure that I'm applying what's called a bending moment. And we'll get into the details of what a bending moment is in a few minutes. But as you are observing this, look at where his fingers are. See, and this, the, his fingers are applying a load, maybe over approximately those three. 
and he also maybe is kind of bringing his hands together just a little bit as he's doing it. Now, uh, those are great observations, um, but for our purposes, for the time being, let's neglect that. Okay, we'll pretend that doesn't happen. And then, uh, you know, if you guys come back for AE5100, that's advanced structures uh, to be offered in the spring, uh, we'll actually get into the details, the nitty gritty of what happens when you get this sort of overall axial compression or tension and large deflections. Um, he's doing what we would consider to be large deflections in this uh, image. When I say large deflections, what I mean is that the sort of relative distance that he's moving the beam compared to its size is quite large. Now that is for visualization purposes. That helps you guys see what's going on, but it really actually complicates the mathematics to some degree. So as we uh, go forward into our uh, Fourier into beam theory, we're actually going to sm assume small curvatures as we uh, do our calculations. But again, that that's uh, a great observation, but something we're going to sort of neglect for the moment. So thank you. Any other observations you'd like to make? I'm not sure if this is extremely obvious, but um, the, uh, oh, what's it called when it changes distance is not uniform. The strain? The deflection? Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure. I think strain's close. Yeah, so what you're saying, I think, if I'm hearing you correctly, like if we look at, you guys can see my mouse, I think. If you look at where I've placed my mouse here, it appears that the strain is, you know, it's obviously it's in compression here. Uh, it has uh, the, the relative length of uh, or distance between two points here has decreased, whereas up here it has increased. Uh, and so obviously there's a non-uniformity there. You may have been suggesting that, uh, say, comparing the distance between these two points and maybe these two points here, um, you know, in an adjacent cell, uh, maybe you're saying that those are a little bit different. And I would say that, yes, in this image, that's true. And that's partly because of the large amount of deflection he's applying and the fact that he's bringing it together a little bit as he does so. Um, whereas if we had a longer beam and we were being very careful about it, you would actually see that this is remarkably uniform when the appropriate load is applied. So um, a great observation. Um, we're going to pretend it's not the same uh, as, cool. as that because of my, um, you know, we, doing, that's one of the reasons why doing this demo in class can actually be, I think, a little bit more effective. But um, what, about what, about across across the so, what about across the center line? What about across the center line? So you're saying uh, what I'm hearing, if, I, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, so the distance between this point and this point, and say maybe this point and this point is different? Uh, the exact opposite. Uh, the exact opposite. So from top so to bottom, top of, the bottom beam, of the beam. Um, oh, so the strain from, there here, is. from here to here is a different length than from here to here? Yeah, between each segment. Or, okay, so, so, so all of those observations that we've been commenting on, um, I, I would say are a product of his bringing his hands a little bit. So he's, he's putting an average compression in a sense along one direction. And, and so you may be seeing that in, in an ideal world, if, if this had been bent very carefully with just a pure bending moment applied to it, uh, we would see that um, these, these links are all identical, essentially that the length uh, largely does not change, or if it changes, it changes by a really small amount. Um, and that, that, that's actually a Poisson effect. And, and eventually you'll, you'll see the equations that we can use that would describe that phenomenon because we're getting approximately the same strain in compression as we're getting strain in tension on the opposite side. So any Poisson effect on one side that would cause it to expand would be taken up by the same amount of shrinkage on the other side. So you'd get this essentially uniformity in vertical length of these lines um, for a, an idealized, idealized beam. Let me uh, jump ahead one more slide here because this is um, – 
another observation. This is the same video. It's just a later moment to the video. And here he's going to show you something else. Okay, let me, let me do that one again. In fact, we can pause right there. Oops, sorry, I missed it. I tried to queue it up. So what I'm showing you now is, um, is actually he's applying what we'll call a shear deformation. And you can see even in this shear deformation for this beam structure, you're getting relatively little, except maybe at the point of his hand here, his fingers, where his fingers are really strongly compressing into the foam. But if you look here, these lines still remain relatively straight, even though he deflected it sort of up and down on opposing hands. So that's another sort of interesting observation of this uh, beam deflection. So uh, having sort of observed this, and this is an observation, this is something that we see in the real world, we observe it. And then by observation, we say, hey, I might be able to use that, that phenomenon that I've observed. I maybe can make an assumption about that. Uh, and from the assumption that I make, that might simplify my elasticity solution. So really that's what engineering beam theory is all about, is we've watched the definition or we've watched the deformation of a beam and having observed it, then we begin to state assumptions about the beam which ultimately greatly simplify our calculations. So let me get into the, the details of that now in this slide. So here I've drawn a, a, a beam cross-section on the left. Um, we're going to say that the, in this example, we're gonna use Z as being along the long axis of the beam and the XY uh, coefficients, or I should say XY coordinate is in the plane of the cross-section of the beam. Um, as it has been drawn here, we've got a, a sort of an arbitrary cross section. There's no symmetry here to the cross section. Um, it's, uh, um, it's not easily described as a rectangle or a square or anything. Of course, those cross sections certainly exist, and we'll get to those as part of our calculation. But in a general sense, the cross section can be any arbitrary cross section. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, based on some observations, we're going to simplify our problem. So what, first of all, what defines a beam? So what I'm now going to describe are the assumptions that underlie our engineering beam theory. Uh, the first one I alluded to earlier, and this one's pretty important to our set of assumptions, uh, or to our calculations, I should say, a beam, by definition, is much longer in one direction than any direction inside its characteristic cross-section. I'll say that again. A beam is much longer in one direction than in any direction in its characteristic cross-section. Now, what do I mean? So here you can see, you know, if I drew a line, any line really across my cross-section, the length of that line would be small relative to the overall length of the beam from one end to the other. Now you'll, you'll in a few minutes see why that assumption is actually quite critical to what we're doing. Um, now when, when we say longer, we have to be a little bit careful, okay? What does longer mean? Longer, of course, can mean different things to different people, but um, I will say that as a good general rule of thumb, the length of the beam should be on the order of, oh, let's say 8x. So approximately greater than or equal to 8x any length inside the cross section. Now, is 8 the right number? No, oh, that's a judgment call. You will, as you pro uh, progress in your career, sometimes decide that eight isn't enough. You need 10. Sometimes you'll say five. Now, what, what does this mean, this number eight? 
So what I'm suggesting is that if you're on the order of eight to 10 uh, greater in length than in any cross section, then beam theory calculations actually turn out to be quite accurate. We're talking within percentages of elasticity solution calculations, you know, one to 2%. When you get down to something like five X, five times, then maybe there's, you, you have, start to have larger errors creep in. So maybe 5%, maybe even 10% at times. Uh, the calculation still can be pretty good, but it's not as good as if it were longer. So when you're observing something, if I give you a homework problem or an exam problem, and it's and this there's this standout style of uh, a, a geometric characteristic where something is much longer than it is in its cross section, uh, you know it's then you would make the statement I'm going to treat this as a beam because the length is approximately eight times the uh, the width. So again, that number is a judgment call, 8x, but it's one that you uh, sometimes need some guidance on. Okay, a beam, what, what else defines a beam? A beam can carry different types of forces, um, and these are now resultant forces. So I'm going to highlight that word, write that down, resultants. And I'm writing with my mouse, so forgive the terrible handwriting, but I think you get the point, resultants. One of those resultants is the axial force, the axial force, the total force along the, in this case, Z direction. The resultant on any cross section is called the axial force, and we will generally refer to that with the letter P. Um, sometimes you can think of that as a point force in the axial direction. Um, that's where the P comes from. Uh, there are other types of forces, of course. Another one is the shear force. So this would be, again, a resultant force on a cross section. But in this case, the resultant force is across the cross section. It's transverse to the long axis of the beam rather than being in the direction of the long axis of the beam. So that will be referred to as a shear force because it ultimately is generating shear stresses on the face. We're going to, in this class, refer to that uh, with the letter S. You will, in some other classes uh, uh, and in some textbooks, see this referred to with the letter V. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, what we call this, and P sometimes is referred to as F instead of P. You know, the, the point is you need to be contextually aware of what type of force exists. Uh, in addition to shear forces, of course, we can then apply something that looks like a distributed load. So this is now pressures. I'm gonna draw several arrows in some sort of pressure distribution. Okay, you can imagine this is uh, maybe snow on a roof where gravity is pulling it and it provides a distributed load. So a distributed load, we're often thinking about it as being transverse. There are, of course, axial distributed loads as well. Um, but for our purpose, we're going to refer to these with a small p rather than a capital P. The lower case, therefore, uh, defines that this is distributed. Uh, there's more. There's also torques. So what is a torque? You know, a torque is, as you probably are aware, a force times a distance. But here in this context, we're talking about resultants. So I'm going to draw an arrow with two arrowheads. So we're going to call that a T. You can think about it if you looked around a cross section and you have a reference point. So a torque is something that creates that type of twist in the beam. So it's a, it's a torsion moment about the long axis of the beam, uh, usually called T, and that's fairly consistent. Amongst all of these, this is the one that's probably the most consistent from textbook to textbook. The last <clears throat> that we're going to share with you now is the one that's called the bending moment. And this is also a torque, okay? So the difference between moments and torques, mathematically they're identical, but in practice they're a little bit different. So torque, again, is a torque around the long axis uh, 
whereas bending moments are torques, but they're applied about the one of the in-plane axes, so either the x-axis or the y-axis. And so these moments are what ultimately cause this curvature in the beam that you saw in uh, the foam demonstration in the video. Okay, so bending moments, we call them bending moments because they cause bending. We refer to them with the letter M. Last but not least, we're going to have something that we call the reference line. So the reference line for the beam is defined as the line of the centroids of the cross section of the beam. Now, when I say line, really, uh, you know, the, the centroidal locations could vary spatially along the length of the beam. So it is a reference line, may not be straight, uh, but it connects the centroids of the beam as you go down the beam axis. Okay, it's reasonable to say for this particular uh, cross section that the centroid is here in the, you know, effectively the middle. And you could have drawn that reference line here on the beam uh, down the middle, but you know you must be cautious. Uh, it's not always in the middle, and in fact, sometimes it certainly is not, and, and that complicates our calculations just a little bit, but we certainly can deal with it. It's not difficult, and we'll get to it shortly. All right, before I continue going on, I'm going to check the chat window to see if there's any questions. Um, Okay, it looks like all the questions in the chat window are related to the foam, and we covered them. So thank you guys for those questions in the chat window. Um, the uh, I think then we can continue forward. Uh, I, I will. I should I guess mention this one last thing, and that's that this reference line uh, is often assumed to be straight, even if it's not straight. So if deviations from the reference line are relatively small. It has minimal impact on our calculation. Um, if uh, the reference line is, is um, much more curved, then sometimes we actually have to account for that curvature. So that, but you know, often it's assumed to be straight. So the next thing we're going to talk about is kinematics of the beam. And this really gets at what we were describing based on the visual uh, picture that we saw of that foam block as it moved, we saw those things. You you guys highlighted them. You said uh, the you know the the line the vertical the initially vertical lines essentially remained perpendicular to the reference line. That's one of them. Uh, there are others. We're going to talk about them shortly. What I've drawn here <clears throat> is a, a graphical representation of a deformed beam. Okay, we'll pretend that it was initially straight and now it is deformed. Uh, you can see the reference line itself has uh, changed, um, meaning it's no longer straight, so it's deformed. Because it's deformed, we can now do things like calculate the derivative of its uh, displacement, its position. So if this initially moved, if this point here initially moved from, say, here, we can say that it has an amount of deflection, which we'll call V. Just to remind you, U, V, and W are the displacements in the X, Y, and Z direction. So the Y displacement is called V, and it is the distance from the initial position to the final position, really in this case of the reference line. Now the, the uh, reference line itself remains um, it, it has some uh, a curvature to it, and we'll deal with that in a minute, but the bottom line that you can take away from this is that we can calculate derivatives of displacement. So for example, I have V comma Z shown here, and that derivative of the displacement now begins to look very much like an angle. Okay, so here's what we're going to say. So I, I, I'm introducing an, a new term Okay, the term is now Euler-Bernoulli beam. Um, this is the most simplistic description of beam theory, making the uh, most stringent assumptions. 
And then we have to relax those assumptions. Once you get to the advanced structural mechanics class, we'll start to talk about something called a Timoshenko beam. But for this class, we're going to talk about an Euler-Bernoulli beam. So just recognize that name and, and sort of tattoo on your brain that this is the easiest beam calculation we can do. So a beam also assumes, and this is also relative to what we've already stated, that it's much longer in one length than its characteristic length within the cross section. We're going to assume that the deformation of this beam can now be described in, in terms, in really in, in this equation. So what we're describing is that the beam itself, the uh, deflection, this is uh, UV or W, um, so it, the out of plane, out of plane deformation can be described by a function where the, uh, I, I, I have to apologize, this is not the out of plane deflection, this is W, this is the in plane deflection. So this is associated with Z, okay? So the W deflection, this is the deflection in the Z direction can be described based on the sort of the deflection of the reference line. So the deflection of this line here plus now some relative change based on position within the cross section. So keep in mind, we had our cross section. We had, uh, you know, say Y direction and X direction like this. Uh, these are drawn to maintain the right-hand rule, uh, X, Y, and Z. And um, so what we see here is at some position Y, we have not only moved with the deflection of the reference line here, we have also moved back a little bit by some function we will call beta as a function of Z uh, that you know, sort of essentially moves that reference line position this way a little bit. Okay, so we're sort of counting on two components of this axial deformation. One is the overall reference line stretch itself, and another has to do with where it is within the cross section. So that's W0 plus beta Z, that's a linear function of Y. And that linear function of y is because we assume, and it's critical that we make this assumption, that that line remains perpendicular. Okay, this is that plane sections remain planar under load. I don't recall precisely who described that in observing the foam deformation, but it was said several times that that line remains perpendicular and it re remains straight. And when it remains perpendicular and straight, we can simply subtract off an amount of deflection or really add an amount of deflection here. We're gonna call that function beta of Z. It's a linear function of Y because that line remains straight. Uh, David's asking a question in the chat window. So is the displacement by W in reference to the centroid line. So uh, the, the displacement W is in reference to the initial position of any portion of the beam. And that uh, displacement can then be described in, in relative terms, in terms that relate to the center line displacement plus some function uh, of the position within the cross section. So great question, David, thank you. So my question is also, so the top looks like it displaces less than the bottom of the beam. Does that also take that into consideration? Yeah, so it does. And the sign of this, um, uh, let, we'll, let, let me go one more slide and you'll see how the signs work out. Because on one side, essentially, this is subtracting displacement. You can see the top surface is moving back a little bit. The bottom surface is moving forward a little bit due to the bending that's occurring relative to the centroidal line. So that means that this function, it will be linear as a function of y uh, on the top uh, since it's going back, but it's positive. We're going to get a negative sign that shows up. But that'll show up in the next slide. So great question. Thank you. Okay, so anyway, so our bottom line statement here is that plane sections remain plane under load, 
Uh, that means that that line remains straight. These, these vertical lines remain, remain straight and plane sections remain perpendicular to the reference line. That means that these lines stay at 90 degrees to the reference line. Um, and this is, this is the definition of an Euler-Bernoulli beam. We're actually going to drop that in advanced structural mechanics, and we're going to say it no longer needs to remain perpendicular. We'll correct for that, and we'll call that a Timoshenko beam. But that ultimately only occurs when beams tend to be very short, or I should say it's, um, it's only non-negligible. It's a, it's a non-trivial contribution only when the beams become short. Anyway, so after observing these things about how a beam deforms from that prior image, stating our assumptions, writing a set of equations, what we can get is now this, this description. This description, that is a, a function that describes our axial deformation, W, and its relationship to a displacement of the center, centroidal line, W0 of Z, that is now only a function of z, because keep in mind the centroid, when we look at a cross section, there's only one point in the cross section that is the centroid. Okay, so this is not a function of x or y, because at the centroid, x and y are always zero. That's the definition of what the centroid will be for us. And so, therefore, this is not a function of x and y. But then the remaining portions are a function of x and y. And you can see that the, uh, just a moment, I'm having a brief interruption. Andrew, this can I help you? I'm in lecture. Can you uh, let me finish, please? Thank you. You can come and get it. Sorry about that. Uh, you, may, you may use the tablet. OK, there you go. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Ah, the trials and tribulations of teaching at home. I think it's actually kind of fun, but uh, I hope it's not too much of a distraction. Okay, so anyway, um, you know, I mentioned the minus sign that's going to come, and that's because on the top surface where Y is positive, when you have this positive uh, curvature, uh, or I should say um, uh, derivative, then you get the negative uh, contribution to W, and um, and it's lin because of the linearity, the, I should say the planarity, because it remains plane and perpendicular, um, it just becomes a linear function of x and y. Okay. <clears throat> now, you guys, so now, uh, before I move on to that next slide, let's just uh, stop here for a moment. I want you to think about what was very difficult. One of the things that was very difficult about solving the problem that we solved uh, last week was that we had to start at stress. And then from stress and its boundary conditions, we then had to calculate strain. And then from strain, we had to calculate displacement. And this ultimately resulted in a number of integrations that we had to do. And we had to come up with a whole bunch of boundary conditions because of the integration constants that arose. So calculating displacement from stress is a can be, I should say, not always, but can be quite a difficult thing to accomplish. However, if you already know the displacement, if you already know the displacement, then calculating strain is easy. You just take derivatives. And if you already know strain, then calculating stress is typically easy because, again, you multiply it by a set of material coefficients. So if you start by writing displacement, the problem gets significantly easier. And as we stare at this bottom equation, now that I've uh, circled with the blue marker, we have an equation for displacement. So from that strain, from that stress, and oh my goodness, we have everything. So this is going to make life much easier. This is why Euler-Bernoulli beam theory is much simpler than calculating the same uh, you know, problem, uh, seeking the same answer, but starting with uh, you know, sort of stress equilibrium equations. But 
in order to achieve this, we had to observe that those sort of properties of the deformation, this idea that plane sections remain plane and perpendicular, that we have a reference line that we can uh, calculate all our uh, displacements from. We had to observe that before we could make these simplifying statements. Okay, so you know what I said was if we have displacement, we can calculate strain, and lo and behold, that is absolutely true. Okay, epsilon zz, we're going to just use the linear term here. We're going to drop the higher order terms uh, for the time being, uh, just to simplify this calculation. Uh, if the deformations are small, that's a perfectly legitimate um, uh, assumption to make. It's only when we start to talk about buckling of beams and things like that where we really absolutely must carry the higher order terms. And we'll do that in advanced structural mechanics next semester. But for this class and for this semester, we'll just keep this linear term. And we'll say epsilon zz, the strain in the z face in the z direction, is by definition partial w partial z, the derivative of the w displacement with respect to the z axis. I hear a question coming. Did I hear a question? Uh, so I'm seeing one from Nicole here in the chat window. So Nicole asks, is W, X, Y, Z the displacement in the Z direction? Yes, it is. Thank you, Nicole, for asking. Um, and then she says, I'm confused how you went from the first W to the second. Okay, let me just briefly go back and address that question because that's a good one. Um, here, what I was describing, the first equation, I was going, I was saying essentially that this is an arbitrary function, that the amount that we sort of uh, add or subtract relative to the centroidal line could in general be a function of the z-axis, but we're saying it's linear with respect to x and y. And so when I am then taking the next step, the next step is that when I say that plane sections remain plane under load and that plane sections remain perpendicular to the reference line, that's when we can look up at this. And let me uh, view this image, uh, blow it up as, maybe as big as I can, see if, well, it doesn't help to blow it up that much, I guess. Um, what you can see is that the amount that you move, the amount that you sort of correct that displacement is dependent very directly on the slope of this uh, line of this reference line at this point. So the further away, you know, keep in mind, all right, let me go back here for a moment. I'm gonna create a blackboard for us. Okay, I'll draw it, I'll draw it bigger. So here, here's what we had. Okay, we had this uh, deflection. Uh, that's, boy, that's a terrible drawing. Let's see if I can erase what I've already, <clears throat> sorry about this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't go to art school. Okay, so that's reasonable. Uh, here's my reference line. Now, at this point, we can draw the tangent to that reference line, and then we can draw the horizontal line, and that defines an angle. That angle also happens to be V comma Z. By definition, what it is because the distance from the original position to the current position is v and the amount of v that you get now being a function of the z direction you can take its derivative and get a slope and then that slope i'm really glad you asked this question because i don't think i fully went through and described this if you you can draw this vertical angle at this point and you can just use ge geometric arguments to say that this angle here is going to be equal to this angle here because this is a right angle and this is a right angle. So this equals this. And because of that, now the distance that we need to correct, say this point here, is the distance between here 
and here, and that just is this height swept through this angle. So the height y swept through the angle v comma z now becomes the correction. Okay, so again, thank you for asking that. I'm not sure I went through and explained that uh, terribly well, but here now I'm going to um, see if I can circle this one point. What I just described was this. Y, the distance from the neutral axis or the reference line to the vertical, um, times V comma Z. Okay, so thanks, Nicole, for asking that. Um, now, again, here we are. We uh, will go on to the strain calculation. What we have, partial W, partial Z, this is just the definition of our uh, epsilon zz, you know, we went over that in our strain uh, section, not, we're, again, we dropped the higher order term. Again, by definition, the shear strain, uh, gamma zy, is going to be equal to dv dz plus dw dy by definition, which is going to be equal to dv0 dz plus beta, that's that function that ultimately turned out to be a linear function, uh, or I should say when we took the derivative uh, with respect to y, that becomes the linear term of that function. Gamma zx becomes du dz plus dw dx, and we can now write du dz uh, plus alpha. Again, that term just drops because of what was there previously. And um, the last thing I'll state is that what we're going to say is that gamma zy and gamma zx are both going to be equal to zero. Now, why is that? Again, that's because the plane sections remain plane and perpendicular because there's perp you, if you remember what shear was, if we look at shear, I'll go back to a blackboard here for a minute. Something that was initially at right angles when we sheared it became something that looked like this. And what we got was this, that's uh, not a great drawing, but we got this change in angle here. That's how we defined shear. Okay. But in our beam calculation, by observation of what's going on in this Euler Bernoulli beam, we're observing that that line essentially remains perpendicular. So this angle then is always going to be zero. And again, this is only true when we have 8x, you know, approximately uh, 8x or more, maybe 10x, maybe 5, depending on how accurate you're trying to make your calculation. When this thing is much longer than its in-plane cross-section, you can reasonably assume that this, this uh, relationship remains perpendicular. If it's less than that, then we get this shear that's present in there, um, and uh, we can no longer make that assumption. But uh, for today, we make that assumption, and we find that this is zero. Okay, so in the end, what we get is that epsilon zz is equal to w0, uh, zero comma zero. So this is the stretch of the reference line. Its derivative now with respect to the z-axis, minus x times alpha comma z minus y times beta comma z. So again, alpha and beta were theoretically functions of z. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, as I sort of described, I think clearly uh, on the last slide, because we're assuming that shear deformation is negligible, because those angles remain right angles and our shear values are zero, because of that, this is how we ultimately can say that alpha of z and beta of z were equal to u comma z and v comma z. So what we've said now is over this slide that you're currently looking at and this slide and this slide, accompanied by the chalkboard that we had with that slide, we have thus concluded that our definition based on uh, our, our definition of a beam uh, strain based on Euler Bernoulli kinematics, that is the zero shear str strain assumption stemming from it being long, 
relative to its in cross section dimension. We can therefore just simply write strain down. It's the stretch of the neutral axis, its derivative with respect to z, minus the position in the x axis times essentially what amounts to the uh, derivative of the out of plane displacement in each of two directions. All right, I'm going to pause there. I know that there still could be some confusion. I want to I'll let this sink in for just a minute, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, could you just repeat that that last explanation that you did of the, the full equation one more time? Okay, so we're, we're, we're talking about this equation. Well, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. If, if you have a mic on, please turn it off. Uh, we're talking about this equation. We're asking how we arrived at this equation. Keep in mind, our conclusion now is that alpha of z was the slope of the reference line, and we had the negative sign in front of it. Um, yeah, beta of z was equal to slope of the reference line. These are in the two dimensions. So one of them is the in-plane uh, up and down, and one of them is the out-of-plane, u and v. So we, we called y the up direction, and so v is the deformation that occurs up and down. u is the deformation that occurs in and out, okay, and their slopes with respect to the z-axis now are the functions alpha and beta. And um, we get ultimately to um, you know, this is having started with writing it generically, we ultimately got to writing the displacement was the first derivative. And therefore, when we now work our way down, what we found is the strain is related to the first derivative of ultimately the first derivative. So we see alpha z is u comma z. We said strain was the derivative of alpha with respect to z. And lastly, we can therefore say that the strain is ultimately related to the second derivative of that out of plane displacement. Now, I'm not sure I, I truly satisfied the question. Did I, did, I, did I answer your question? Is it clear or do I need to go back and go a little bit more slowly? Um, I was just wondering, the, uh, just the way that you described it, uh, if you go back to the strain and the z, um, the way that you described it, I was just wondering if you could say that one more time. You like broke down each of the, the three components. Okay, so yeah, the three components. We can just leave this equation on the screen then. Um, I'm, I'm getting the feedback. Can you mute, please? Um, the By the way, so slightly tangentially, in fact, more than slightly, um, I don't know if you've ever uh, heard of it before, but um, someone in, in uh, Japan invented a device. I forget exactly how they titled it, but it's essentially a, a be quiet device or a shut up device. And what they have learned is that if you take somebody's speech, if they're speaking, and you record and play their speech back to them, but with some sort of time delay, of I, it's on the order of half of a second, something like that. That if you do that, that uh, the brain naturally stops speaking because it's hard to you know, hear yourself speak and simultaneously speak, especially if they're, uh, the words that you're saying are very adjacent to uh, the, uh, the words, you know, if they're being played back to you on a slight time delay. So uh, they actually have, it's kind of like a ray gun. You can it's got a mic on one end and the speaker, and you can point it at somebody, and it'll, it'll pick up what they're saying and play it back. And uh, you know, most people uh, can't continue to speak, at least not without very serious effort, if you've done this. And so that um, is something that I was experiencing uh, just a moment ago. <laughs> anyway, let's get back from our tangent here. Um, the uh, okay, so the three components. So here we have epsilon zz. The first of the three, this one here, w0, z. 
that one is the displacement of the reference line. W0, I should say. W0 is the displacement of the reference line. Comma Z denotes the partial derivative with respect to Z. So if in the absence of bending, if you don't think of any bending and all you're doing is stretching the beam, this is the term that picks up the sort of natural, well-understood phenomenon of the, the derivative of the displacement is the strain in that direction. So that's what this is. And this is the stretch of the reference line. Okay. Now the other terms, x, of course, is position within the cross-section relative to our centroidal location. And I've been drawing it like this. So we call that x and this y. So at this point here, we have, have some magnitude of x and some magnitude of y. Okay, the next term is the second derivative of the out-of-plane displacement. So if we had our initial beam was in this position and it had a reference line initially in that position, and then we drew the deformed position of the beam and its new reference line, so here... The distance between here and here, we would call, because the y direction is up, we would call that v. Um, and really, when we're thinking of the second derivative, we need to think through what the derivatives are. I'll go to the blackboard again here for a moment. So if I draw this, okay, and at any point, I can draw the reference line, and I can draw a tangent to the reference line. Okay, and what is defined there is an angle, which we have said is the slope, or equivalently the first derivative. You know, you could call it, uh, what do we want to call it? We could say theta, okay, slope, it's an angle. It's also the first derivative. Now, what you see is as this thing is bending, you get curvature. Now, what's the difference between curvature and slope? You know, that's a natural question. Uh, if you're able to see, um, I know that for most of you, my face is probably in a very small window if it's visible at all. I'll give you a moment to sort of pin, pin my face to your uh, screen if you would like to do so. Okay, I'm holding up a pen. Now, what's the difference between slope and curvature? So slope, again, it's V comma Z, so it's an angle. Now, what I can do is I can rotate the whole pen. This is a rigid body motion. I have a, a value for V, that's the amount of Y displacement that I've introduced, and I have a slope, but I've deformed this thing with rigid body motion. So I've not introduced any strain in the pen. So there's no stretch that's going on internally within the, in the pen. This is just rigid body motion. So intuitively, we understand that strain is not related to slope. It actually has to be related to curvature, that is change of slope. Now you can maybe, whoa, just broke my pen. Well, that's a bummer. That's my nice... Uh, uh, a touch sensitive pen that I can draw on my uh, not terribly good um, electronic notepad. So I guess it's not such a bad loss after all. <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is, of course, that now I need a new pen to bend. Uh, we'll have to imagine with this envelope, okay? It's only as I introduce curvature that we're actually getting strain in the top surface and strain in the bottom surface. Now, you saw that, of course, in the uh, video that we showed at the very beginning of this lecture. That foam that we bent, the top surface uh, was in compression. The points uh, that were defined by the vertical lines got closer together. At the bottom surface, the points got further apart. That came from the curvature that is ultimately the second derivative, v comma zz. This is curvature, and that's because this tangent line is different 
you know, I, I drew a tangent line that was tangent at this point. I could have drawn a tangent line that was tangent at that point. So the tangent line is continually changing as a function of z. So that derivative now defines what we call curvature. And that curvature is now what we're describing as being directly proportional to the strain. And that, of course, applies both in the vertical direction and in the out-of-plane direction. So one of them is u comma zz and the other one is v comma zz. So I hope that that is uh, uh, understandable. Is that is that uh, coherent to you? I'm seeing some, uh, I don't know what F means. Maybe you guys were, ah, rest in peace, poor pen. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that the F probably is not a good word. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, is, did I answer the question? Oh, F is a meme that means paying respect. So oh, thanks, Ethan. I'm clearly not culturally aware. You know, it doesn't take long after you're out of your 20s before you start to lose touch with uh, the, the young people. Um, and I'm actually not in my 30s anymore even, so there you go. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, not hearing any complaints, I think each of these three individual components is now clear. One is the stretch of the reference line itself. One is related to the curvature and linearly proportioned to position uh, within the cross section. Uh, U comma ZZ, V comma ZZ, again, curvatures of the reference line in the XZ and YZ planes. Okay, stress is in a beam. So uh, just take a peek at the time. We have about 10 minutes left. Stress, so, you know, again, what have we done? Calculating derivatives, super easy, right? You guys can uh, calculate derivatives, especially of things like polynomial or trigon trigonometric functions. You know, you can do that in your sleep. Very simple to calculate. And so you can calculate strain very easily because you now know something about the deformation and you know how to take derivatives. The last thing you need to do is be able to calculate stress. Of course, for this problem, uh, the relationship between stress and strain is very simple. That is that uh, stress is simply the modulus, Young's modulus E times the strain. And so now I've written in strain. Note I'm expressing strain now in this way, epsilon zz0. That's the strain of the reference line. Um, that is w0 comma z. Uh, that just allows me to sort of drop one subscript, stretch of the reference line. Um, often, actually, we're going to, for reasons that you'll see next lecture, or maybe even today if we get to it, um, this is going to be something that we calculate separately and then superimpose on the problem uh, most of the time. Okay, so uh, this is stress. Very simple. Now, at the beginning of the lecture, or at least at the beginning of describing how we treat beams, I emphasized that, I, that uh, beams carry loads, and those loads are represented as resultant loads on a cross-section. Resultant loads on a cross-section. So now that we've been able to write down the strain, write down the deformation first, then easily calculate the strain and easily calculate the stress, the next thing that we can do is calculate the force resultants. And so we'll take a few minutes to do that. Here's the first one. We're going to calculate the resultant Again, maybe that word should be here, resultant. Resultant axial load in a beam. Well, what is this? This is an easy thing conceptually to do. What I've drawn is sort of a free body diagram. I took cuts on two sides. Really, we're only focused on this one side for the minute. So on this particular face, we're going to have a resultant force, which I'm going to call P. And what is P? So we can just think of this as if this is our uh, sort of cut. And I've already described how there is stress as a function of our cross section here. And I don't have to be too accurate in how I draw this, although this is not going to 
you know, the, this weird shape that I've drawn is actually not a great one. So ignore the shape. Treat it as whatever you guys draw in your own notes. Treat this as a, a line between the top and the bottom. Um, anyway, the, the point is, is that the overall resultant force on the whole face is simply the integral over the area of the differential area dA. So if I took a little portion of the area and I said, okay, at that point, we have a stress. This is dA. And if I integrate over the domain of the area dA times sigma zz, I get the total resultant force P. This is the resultant force along the length of the beam, its long axis uh, over the entire area. And of course, as you probably recognize dA, the differential area, again, our cross section looks something like this. You know, we're not going to worry about it too much. The whole thing has area A, and what we're doing is we're taking a little dA like so. We're integrating over dA, and, and that's uh, functionally the integral. dA, therefore, is just a small uh, increment of dx and a small increment of dy multiplied together. And so having done that calculation, or at least expressed it, <clears throat> here's sigma zz. We, of course, know what sigma zz is. It's directly related to the strain that's present. We know that strain is equal to the modulus, I'm sorry, stress is equal to the modulus times the strain because I'm going to assume for the purposes of our calculation today that the modulus is constant over the cross section. I get to pull it outside of the integral. And so now I'm integrating epsilon zz zero minus x u comma zz minus y v comma zz over dA. Uh, I see uh, Garrett's asking in the chat, are we assuming these beams are cylindrical in reference to the cross-section drawn? Uh, no, in, in practice, that's not an assumption. I could have drawn this equally like this, right? The, although we have to be careful because we're placing, for reasons that we're going to get to very soon, we place the origin of our coordinate system at the centroid. Now, in practice, we could have beams that, in, in fact, in aircraft, we often do have beams that are uh, not rectangular, not square. In fact, they look more like channels like this. Sometimes it turns out that the centroid is actually not even on the cross section. Okay, um, so it can be, it is possible that the or, origin of our xy coordinate system is not on the cross section. Uh, but to answer your question, no, we're not assuming rectangular, or circular, or elliptical, anything like that. Uh, this is an arbitrary area. The integral of dA is always a uh, sort of irrespective of um, how we define everything else that's going on in the problem. Okay, so anyway, we're integrating over the area, the strain, uh, and we multiply the whole thing times modulus. So epsilon zz0, now we have to look at these individually. Epsilon zz0, we've got to think about what this one is. Epsilon zz0, so this was the strain of the reference line. Strain of the reference line. Now, it's notable that the reference line is a single point within the cross-section. Okay? Now, that point, no matter whether you're talking, you, you know, from the view of the cross-section, this point is always going to have the same strain, irrespective of if you've got a DA here or a DA here or a DA here. All of those, for all of those, because this is constant with respect to the cross-section, uh, epsilon zz0 is always going to be the same. So we can actually pull that outside of the integral. Now, looking at the remaining terms, u comma zz, so this is the curvature of the reference line. Curvature of the reference line. So once again, if we look at this, the reference line is always this point. And the cur with respect to the integral over dA, the curvature of the reference line will always be the same, irrespective uh, 
of dA. So once again, we pull it outside of the integral. And lastly, of course, the, the last one, V comma is easy, also gets pulled outside of the integral. What we have left are really simple integrals, the integral of dA, the integral of x dA, and the integral of y dA. And we have just a minute or two left. So let's uh, complete these integrals and then we'll call it a day. So we can define some terms and these are terms you've probably heard of a number of times before. You maybe not have not thought about them in quite the same way, but the integral of dA is just the area, super simple. Now, the integral of x dA you have seen this integral in past classes. Uh, it probably sort of went in one ear and out the other for some of you. For others, maybe you thought about it very deeply. Uh, but this integral on the left-hand side is by definition what the centroid is. So from this integral, actually, I mean, I, we, we would have to say, uh, xc is equal to the integral of x dA over uh, the area. Okay, we this is the way you've seen this before. We're now reconfiguring that equation to look like so. And so we get the, the integral x dA is simply the centroid times the area. The integral of y dA, likewise, the centroid times the area. And so we get, of that whole integral, here's what we have left. So uh, P, the uh, resultant axial force, is simply equal to EA times the strain of the reference line minus XC times A times the curvature minus YC times A times the curvature. Now, keep in mind, we chose, or at least now choose, our coordinate system in such a way that xc and yc is equal to zero. I've stated several times throughout this lecture today that we're orienting ourselves so that the origin of the xy coordinate system is at the centroid, such that xc and yc in this case would be equal to zero. That's a choice. We can choose any origin we want, but if we choose that one, well, what happens? I'm going to put this uh, last thing on here so that people can copy it down. Uh, the resultant axial force p, we're calling it p, resultant axial force, is nothing more then EA, the modulus times the area, times the strain of the reference line. And you could have also equivalently said that this is now equal to area times, if I said E epsilon ZZ zero, you would now see that this is something that amounts to an average stress. Okay, so uh, we're going to stop at the uh, stop there today. I think that's a good place to stop. We'll talk about bending moments next time. Um, so ultimately, what did we learn today? Well, we learned I think a number of things. Amongst them is that we can simplify elasticity solutions in some circumstances with certain geometries by sort of observing how things deform and stating some assumptions. And then once I've stated the assumptions, I can uh, make some uh, much more simple calculations. So that's the first conclusion. The second conclusion is that we can write the uh, stress, strain, and displacement of a beam really quite easily. This is what we're calling an Euler-Bernoulli beam. Um, all we, the, sort of the only open questions now are how much curvature exists. We're going to get to that in the next uh, lecture. But ultimately, uh, 
um, th those calculations will be uh, order an order of magnitude simpler than uh, the calculation that we tried to do at the end of last week uh, that we did succeed at, but took us a whole lecture. Um, and then the last conclusion is that by choosing a coordinate system of convenience, i.e. originating our cross sections uh, coordinate system at the centroid, by doing that, we can calculate the resultant force as simply being equal uh, proportionally uh, to EA times the stretch of the reference axis. Really critically, the resultant force in the axial direction is unrelated to the bending of the beam. We do not see curvature in this calculation. We do not see curvature. This is only related to the stretch of the reference axis. Very big conclusion. OK, so I got a question. Um, from David, David asks, what's the denominator of the thing written in blue? Okay, so this is not a, a numerator and a denominator. This was a me trying to do one of these things that highlighted that this is the average stress of uh, this E epsilon. Uh, so this was a curly bracket oriented to point down to stress. So there you go. I hope that's clear. Um, see here Joel asked we learned <laughs> we learned the stress limits of a pen we sure did uh, uh, Nicole asked could you possibly upload solutions to homeworks three and four uh, yeah I'm gonna uh, see uh, where Xander was with those before um, before he left for his leave uh, I hope to update those and post them soon um, I certainly won't have any quizzes or anything on uh, homeworks three or four um, before those solutions are out for a little while. By the way, we are sort of in quiz season now, so don't be surprised if we get a brief quiz in one of the lectures. Um, you know, and hint, hint, often I, I ask questions that are either directly related to something we did in lecture or alternatively some problem that you did uh, in your homework. Uh, so uh, again, hint, hint, I would strongly recommend you're keeping up with the homework solutions that have been released when they're released, go through them, make sure you understand all of them uh, because um, you know, often if we do have a pop quiz, it would be very directly related to that. 